before we plunge into this Thanksgiving, the Sabbath before homily. I want to pray with you. Father, now thank we all our God. What shall we say except thank you? We're alive. We're here. We've got our masks on. We're, we're physically distanced. That's okay. You're in this space, and we're here because we want to we connect with you. We have been all morning long, and now these last few moments in the Word of God. Don't let that connection miss us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Somewhere in the Bible, there is a line that goes something like this. He, speaking of God, he has placed eternity in our hearts, in every human heart. I don't care how you were born. I don't care who you are now. You may, be an, you, you may say, listen, I'm really an atheist. I'm just here because I'm, I'm with some friends. Okay, glad you're here. You say, no, I'm really an agnostic. I'm not an atheist. I'm just not sure. Okay, still glad you're here. You say, no, I'm a believer. Glad you're here as well. I don't care how you have come to this moment in life. The truth of the matter is, embedded in our psyches is this eternity thing. What is this eternity thing? I found a book. Oh, man, I'm, a, I'm glad for a friend of mine who gave me this book. This is, this is a dynamite book. It's written by John Eldridge. The title of the book, The Journey of Desire, Searching for the Life We've Only Dreamed Of. He, something he writes in a paragraph just unlocks it for me, and I have to share it with you. The big debate I had was, okay, do I, come on, shall we put it on the screen, okay, so that we have the quotation right here? But the more I wrestled with this, I said, no, no, no. If, if it goes into your eyes, it won't get to your heart. We got to do it so that it'll go through your ears and then your heart will hear what your ears are picking up. So I'm going to read it. It's just a short paragraph. I'm not going to put it on the screen. This is John Eldridge. He begins with the, with the well, you know him well, the French mathematician and philosopher, Blaise Pascal. You heard of Blaise Pascal, haven't you? This famous line of his, he actually opens this paragraph up with Pascal's line. The heart has its reasons, which reason knows not. So the heart knows what can't be known up here. The heart has its reasons, what reason knows not. He has put eternity in our hearts. Could that be it? Now, Eldridge goes on. Something in us longs, hopes, maybe even at times believes that this is not the way things were supposed to be, this pandemic world that we're surviving in. Our desire fights the assault of death upon life. And so he gives these three illustrations. People with terminal illnesses get married. Why get married? You're not going to live that long. There's something in us. Prisoners in a concentration camp Plant flowers. Why are you planting those flowers? You'll never see them in your life. And here's another one. Lovers long divorced still reach out in the night to embrace one who is no longer there. He says it's like the phantom pain experienced by those who have lost a limb. You've heard about phantom pain? Feelings still emanate from that region where once was a crucial part of them, and they will sometimes find themselves being careful not to bang the corner of a table or slam the car door on a leg or an arm long since removed. Our hearts know a similar reality. At some deep level, this is good, at some deep level, we refuse to accept the fact that this is the way things are or must be or always will be. He has placed eternity in our hearts. There's, there's, there is this subliminal sense that there is something more. And I'm not there yet. I really was blessed by reading G.K. Chesterton, one of the bright and witty uh, writers, English writers of the 20th century. His book, Orthodoxy. So I read the book through, and then I came across a line that just, whoa, this is G.K. Chesterton. He was an agnostic. And then he discovered that Jesus Christ is a real being and a personal Savior, and he became a believer in Christ. And then he wrote, later, later, after becoming a Christian, now I could understand why I could feel homesick at home. Homesick at home. Do you ever feel homesick at home? 
I mean, why am I feeling homesick? This is, this is where I live. Something deep inside of you is longing for a place you are not there yet. I'm feeling homesick at home. Oh, I got to put this line on the screen. I want to tell you something. This is the first time I've ever done this. Do you know that the, uh, the uh, physics major that put this PowerPoint program together that you're, you're about to see? got tested the other day, he's positive. He can't leave campus. Some of you are leaving in a few hours. He has to stay in that prayer apartment. <laughs> you know that place. <laughs> so he's watching right now. So he's not up there switching. I'm gonna do it right here. Please pray for me. <laughs> if nothing happens here, we'll just have benediction, we'll go. I mean, that's it. All right. Here's that line. He has placed eternity in our hearts. I'm homesick at home. Something is in here that has been embedded in me. I don't care what you believe or don't believe. He has placed eternity in our hearts. Could it be that we've been made to live somewhere else? Somewhere that is COVID-19 free? Somewhere that is racially fractured free? somewhere that is politics free and pain free and perplexity free, could it be we're not where we're supposed to be? He has placed eternity in our hearts. Turns out it's been that way from the very beginning in this pandemic of sin planet. For a moment, I want to go with you to the ancients. Take your Bible out. They are like we are. Watch this. Go to the Bible's Hall of Fame, Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. Come on. This is, this is dynamite. Look at these ancients. Hebrews chapter 11. That's the New Testament, near the end of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11. And let's drop down. Let's drop down to, uh, let's drop down to verse 13. Hebrews chapter 11. I'll be in the New International Version. Come on. How did they live back then? You'll see it. You'll, you'll immediately recognize this. Verse, verse 13, all these people, these ancients, were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. Uh-uh. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners. If you have the New King James Version, it reads pilgrims. There's a word for Thanksgiving. Admitting that they were pilgrims. They were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Nuh-uh. Instead, they are longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. He has embedded eternity in their hearts. The ancients knew it. I'm homesick and I'm home. What's wrong with me? Ah, something deep within your psyche tells you you're not home yet. What is up with this? Ted Decker, in his whimsical book, The Slumber of Christianity, Awakening a Passion, a Passion for Heaven on Earth, captures the grip of hope and hopelessness we all in this COVID-19 moment are experiencing together. Hope and hopelessness. Let's go to Decker. What elevates our emotions and what dashes them to the ground? What makes us jump for joy and what sends us into a pit of deep discouragement? The answers are surprisingly simple. Hope and hopelessness. You want to talk about this pandemic world? This crisis that doesn't seem to want to let go of us. There's not a soul here right now watching online right now. I don't care where you live on the planet right now. There's not a soul wrestling between hope and hopelessness. Decker goes on. Hope is the primary force that drives human beings from hour to hour. Hope for a simple pleasure, a hug, a kiss, a juicy rib eye cooked to perfection. That's talking about Loma Linda or Worthington Foods. That's what they're talking about. I'm telling you. That's what it means. He didn't know how to say it, so he put it that way. <laughs> Speaking of desire, a new red Corvette. You know what? Hit the pause button right there. I, this last week, about four or five days ago, remember when it was still warm around here? I saw a guy. I'm telling you the truth. I don't know. I think it might have been a yellow vet, a yellow Corvette T-top. The top is off. 
And this guy is just showing off, driving around with his blonde hair, blowing in the wind. And I say, show off. <laughs> Have you seen my Toyota Camry? <laughs> oh, man, you can dream. It's okay to dream. This desire you have, this hope, a, a new red Corvette, a beautiful home, mm, a long vacation in Europe, the renewed health of an ill child. There's not a parent here that's experienced that that doesn't know the meaning of that hope. Or the, the, the renewed health of an aging mother. I've been through that. These are among the many hopes that motivate our daily lives. Everything we do is driven by hope or hopelessness in one form or another. Now get this last line. If you think about what changes your mood from one of happiness to one of sadness, you will always find hopelessness. So listen, we're talking about Generation Z on this campus right now. The most self-identified, I have mental health issues generation in the history of American education. And most of them will identify, I have depression. I'm not challenging that for one second. What's depression about? It's about sadness. What's sadness about? It's about hopelessness. I've lost hope. I've lost hope. Some of you know exactly what that feels like. Your roommate has lost hope. You're still going strong. Your roommate has lost hope. That kid across the hall, that kid across the classroom, you know what she's going through. Hopelessness. We live with it. This battle between hope and hopelessness. Welcome to our world. Man, no more face-to-face -face teaching now. No, we're all going remote. Yep, we've got a two-month two vacation, then we've got to come back again. Maybe it'll be remote then too. Don't know. Who knows? Hopelessness. Mortuaries running out of space. Yeah. What's that line? What is that line? He has put, he has placed eternity in our hearts. Something inside of us knows, I am homesick and I'm home. Why am I homesick at home? There's something been embedded in you, that's why. You were made to live somewhere else. It's amazing that when God, God liberates that horde of slaves from Egypt, sets them free in the mighty exodus. Do you know that what God immediately starts doing is tapping into this eternity embedded in even a slave's heart? I'll show you how God did it. Do you remember that, you remember that roaring green bush that didn't burn? It stayed green. You remember that? The bush stayed green. Moses is standing in front of him and the voice is, on your knees in front of me. You're on holy ground now. And God booms from that, from that bush. I want you to notice what he says. Look at this. This is Exodus chapter 3, verse 17. And I have promised to bring you and the children of Israel up out of your misery in Egypt. Isn't that good? This life of misery is not destined to land forever and ever. It will not last forever ever and ever. God is going to pull us out of this land of misery one day. I have promised to do that for you. And I'm going to take you into a land flowing with what? Come on, milk and honey. <laughs> do you know that for 40 long, dusty wilderness years, it's that thought of milk and honey that just kept Israel going. I'm telling you what, if I'd had to live those 40 years, I don't think milk and honey would have done it. I mean, would you be real jazzed about milk and honey? We talking about graham crackers? Milk and honey, 20 times in the, in the Old Testament, God keeps talking about milk and honey, milk and honey. Oh, you can hardly wait, milk and honey. Milk and honey, what's milk and honey about? I found one commentator said, well, what it's really about is that milk and honey were the simplest and choicest productions of a land abounding in grass and flowers, which the land of Canaan was, and were found in Palestine in great abundance. That's the big deal. It's gonna be a land just flowing with milk and honey. In fact, 1,000 years after the Exodus, 1,000 years later, God is still dying dangling that milk and honey promise. He does it through the young prophet Ezekiel. Watch this. They're all in Babylon. They're in exile. This is uh, Ezekiel chapter... Oh, I guess I changed it. This is Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 6. God says, and on that day... I swore to the children of Israel that I would bring them out of Egypt into a land I had searched out for them. There's a land that God has picked out for you and me too, by the way. He has searched it out. A land flowing with milk and honey. And now I want you to notice, only in Ezekiel will you read this line, the most beautiful of all lands. I'm looking, I'm looking behind the, your masks, and I'm realizing we have people from Brazil. We've got people, people, of course, from the USA. We've got people from Africa. We've got people from Asia right now. 
when God says, when God calls Israel the most beautiful of all lands, that was true for a Jew. That's not true for me. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. For me, the most beautiful of all lands is my homeland, but it's your homeland too. But the fact of the matter is, whether it's your homeland or mine, we can be sitting in the middle of our homeland and be homesick for somewhere else. I have planted eternity in your hearts. Wow. He's placed eternity down deep right now. I got to read that again. Come on. Hebrews 11. The ancients. This is, this is, this is the deal behind this, this passage here. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They were homesick, and they were at home, but they were homesick for somewhere else. They did not receive the things promised. No, they didn't. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners, pilgrims, strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. That's what they're saying. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have gone back, but they didn't go back. Why? They were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared, that's the key word right there, he has prepared a city for them. Less than 24 hours from now, he will be dead and buried. But before he dies, he speaks words that have become the favorite words of Christians throughout the generations of two millennia who have returned to these words again and again, and I want to return to them with you right now. John chapter 14. Let's read it out loud together. Let not your heart be troubled. Come on, keep reading. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare, there's that word, prepare, prepare, prepare. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Come on, out loud. That where I am, there you may be also. He has placed eternity in our hearts, embedded in our psyches, even if we never have heard of John 14, 1 to 3, for one second of our lives. Something subliminal, like phantom pain, a phantom hope that longs for what's not there to be there. Wow. There was that old gospel song. Did you ever hear that gospel song, by the way? I'm homesick for heaven. Am I the only guy that's heard that? You ever heard that? I'm homesick for heaven. Seems I cannot wait. Yearning to enter Zion's pearly gate. There never a heartache, never a care. I long for my home over there. Homesick. Jesus promises as good today as the night he made it before he died. I guess the question that begs to be asked is, listen, if we've got this eternity, this, this, this longing for another home, subconscious and subliminal, what in the world is that home to be? Oh, I got to share this with you. I, I, years ago, I came across this in Christianity Today magazine, uh, a piece written by Harry Blamires. He makes a point I had never seen before, and it just clicked with me then. And I got to share it with you. I dug it up. Here it is. Harry Blamires on the screen. If only we could have the positives of earthly life without the negatives. Oh, that's a thought. But that is precisely what heaven has to offer, the removal of the negatives. Now watch this. In heaven, both human sin and the dominion of time will be swept away. Here below, time withers flowers and human beauty. Time encourages good intentions to evaporate. Time deprives us of our loved ones. Within the universe ruled by time, the happiest marriage ends in death. Bad news. The loveliest woman becomes a skeleton. Bad news. Fading and aging, losing and failing, being deprived and being frustrated. These are negative aspects of life in time. Life in eternity will liberate us from all loss, from all deprivation, end quote. Man, that clicked with me. 
The only way that I can picture heaven, think about this, the only way that I can picture heaven is if I think in the negatives. What's not there? What's not there? Eliminate all those negatives. I have heaven on earth. My. It's no wonder these words are often read at a funeral. One, come on, one last time to the apocalypse. Revelation chapter 20. This is a bonus part to the 10-part series we've already finished. Chapter 21, excuse me. Chapter 21. This is a bonus part, so now there are, there are 11 parts to it. But we needed this. Revelation 21, verse 1. Let's just read this together. I want you to count the negatives. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that there's seven. See if you can uh, see if this number bears up, with, corroborates with your own uh, counting here. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Quotation marks. This is straight from Isaiah 65. This has been a promise from the beginning. The Old Testament promise. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is John. This is John Boy now, the elderly John. He's incarcerated on this penal outcropping in the middle of the azure waters of the Aegean Sea. There's water, water, water everywhere. He's writing now. He says, and then I was shown. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any what? Isn't that amazing? Negative number one. Write it down in your mind. There's that first negative. There is no longer any sea because water stands between John and those he loves. The closest people on earth to him are beyond the horizon, water as far as you can see. No more separation in heaven. No more anything coming between you and me. There'll be no more. There's negative number one. There'll be no longer any sea. Keep reading. And I saw the holy city. Remember this? Hebrews 11 said they're looking for a city. Here it is. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Oh, that's just a beautiful picture. Wow. And I heard a megalophone. I heard a megaphone loud voice from the throne saying, look. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. How would you like to wake up one morning and realize God is living next door? I mean, would that be something or what? Living next door to the Almighty. That's what it's going to be. Keep reading. Now, here they come. Okay, how many negatives do we have so far? We got one. Okay. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Pause button. There's negative number two. No more tears. Okay, we got two now. He, he will wipe away every tear. Hallelujah. From our eyes. There will be no more death. That's number three. There will be no more mourning. That's number four. There will be no more crying. That's number five. There will be no more pain. That's number six. For the old order of things has passed away. The old order, number seven, is gone. Seven negatives. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. I've got good news for you earthlings. Everything's going to be new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Can I get an amen to that? These words are trustworthy and true. This COVID-19 hell that some of us are moving through right now will come to an end. You can count on it. Take this to the bank in my name, God says. Wow. He had to do it by negatives. Isn't that amazing? Hey, I want you to see if I missed any negatives, okay? So I put a little list together. Is that okay? I'm going to read my list to you. The, 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 the no, 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 no more of this, no more of that. Here's my list. There'll be no more hospitals in heaven, true or false. Come on. In between services, I got a text from a friend of mine saying, Dwight, I'm in excruciating pain. They're going to have to go in. I've got, I've got crushed discs. No more hospitals. No more divorce courts. No more prisons, jails, penitentiaries. No more food stamps. No more sleeping bags or garbage bags for the homeless. No more homeless. No more friendless. No more chemo. No more COVID. No more abuse. No more bankruptcies. No more anger. No more arguments. No more fighting. No more killing. No more robbing. No more crime. No more hatred, lying, cheating, losing, and sinning. No more. None of that will be in heaven. Did I leave anything out? 
There'll be none of it, whatever you think of. There'll be none of that either. It won't be there. How did Blam, Blammeyer put it? Let me look back here. How did he describe it? He said, it's the removal of the negatives. That's what heaven will be. The removal of the negatives. Ah, but come on. Let's not end with the negatives. That's a, what will not be there. I say let's end. Before I sit down, let's end with the positives. All right, we'll end with the positives. What will be in heaven? And let's go to our friend Ellen White. Hey, Ellen, would you mind helping us out, please? We want to know what are the positives. Okay, so I got these from her. Here are seven of them. I'll run them by you. Those, those of you that are list takers, you pin uh, people, if you want lists, here's, here's a list now. Seven positives. We know what the seven, ne seven negatives are. Let's do the positives. Let's go. All right. Positive number one, Jesus himself will be in heaven. Can I get an amen to that? I mean, come on, folks. Here she's writing. Heaven is where Christ is. Heaven would not be heaven to those who love Christ if he were not there. If Jesus is not going to be in heaven, do I want to go? No, I don't want to go. Jesus bought me. He bought my life by dying for me forever. He thought he was dying forever. My God, why, my God, why have you forsaken me? If Jesus isn't there, I'm not going. But of course he's there. Wow. In fact, you know what? Speaking of negatives, the only negatives that will never be banished from the universe, watch this, the only negatives will be when you take Jesus' hand and right here you will see an ugly purple scar and you'll see another one that matches it here. And right here you will see a large scar where a Roman lance went through. And right here, you'll see little tiny scars all over his forehead. And you ought to see his back. You're, and you ought to see his ankles. Those will be the only evidence of the negatives left in the universe. And one day, you and I are going to sit beside Jesus. We'll take turns and we'll draw numbers. And we're going to have that moment. And we're going to hold his hand. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to burst into tears. You'll start crying. You say, I'm a tough man. I don't cry. Oh, yes, you will. When you hold the hand of your Savior... When you hold the hand of Jesus, you don't think you're going to be crying? You'll be crying. And I'll be there saying, see, I told you. <laughs> no, Jesus will be there, folks. Of course. Positive number one, Jesus himself will be there. But watch this. Positive number two, the Father himself will be there. Oh, same teenage girl who grew up to write as she did. The people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son. We shall see the Father face to face without a dimming veil between. We shall stand in the Father's presence and behold the glory of his countenance. There are some of you here, listen to me, who have never been deeply loved by a Father in your life, and you know it, and God knows it, and nobody else does. You have never been deeply loved by a Father in your life. I have some very good news for you. One day you're going to be in the presence of your father who has always been your father, whose love is so strong it will nearly suffocate you as he reaches out to embrace you. And you know at last the meaning of a father's love. I promise you. Positive. Positive number one, Jesus is there. Positive number two, the Father is there. And oh, I love this one. Positive number three, our guardian angel. <laughs> this, this place is filled with angels right now. They're kind of smiling. They're enjoying this moment with you. Your guardian angel will be there. Listen to this. Same little teenager grown up to become the most published American female author in the history of America. Here are her words. Every redeemed one will understand the ministry of angels. And I'm just, I'm just going to turn these all to you. Every redeemed one will understand the ministry of angels in your own life. The angel who was your guardian from your earliest moment. The angel who watched your steps, who covered your head in the day of peril. The angel who was with you in the valley of the shadow of death, who marked your resting place, who was the first to greet you in the resurrection morning. That angel, what will it be to hold conversation with that angel and to learn the history of divine interposition in the individual life of heavenly cooperation in every work for humanity? That angel's going to say, hey, girl, you remember that day? There was a, something just went, and you said, what was that? 
You remember that day? I was there. That was a cement truck. One split second off. And you'd have died a lot younger than you did. That was me. Are you serious? Yeah. Can you imagine having a conversation with your angel? You remember that day, girl? Boy, when you were crying your eyes out, you didn't want any boy to see you crying, but you were crying your eyes out. You were trying to connect with a father in heaven that you simply could not connect with. You were crying so hard. I was crying with you. And I kept you from hurting yourself. That was me. When we hear the story through another set of eyes and ears and a friend, oh, man. Positive. What is this? Positive number three. Come on. Is there another one? Yep. Positive number four. God's friends, friends through all history are going to be there. Oh, this is good. This is, this is uh, the same writer. There the redeemed shall know, even as also they are known, the pure communion with holy beings, the harmonious social life in heaven with the blessed angels and, now keep, keep reading, and with the faithful ones of all ages who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb, the sacred ties that bind together the whole family in heaven on earth, what will it be? These help to constitute the happiness. We're not gonna be in heaven all alone. We're gonna be together. And with every friend God has ever had in the history of the human race, we're going to be together. So who do you want to talk to when you get to heaven? Come on, tell me. Who do you want to talk to when you get to heaven? Ah, uh, you want to see your mother because you didn't get a chance to say goodbye to your mother. Of course, of course. Who else? Outside of your immediate family, who else? Some of you are, are, had to write a term paper on the book of Romans for that religion class you had to take. You have a big question for Paul. Why were you so confused when you wrote the book. Please be polite to him. He is the author, and he'll explain it. Can you imagine sitting down with Paul? How about, his, maybe it's Moses. You were always fascinated with law, and so you wanted to sit down with a real lawgiver and find out how that mind, that brilliant mind worked. Maybe you want to sit down with Martin Luther. What's wrong with sitting down with Martin Luther? Will Martin Luther be in heaven? Are you kidding? How about William Miller? Hey, William, what was it like preaching the end of the world, Jesus is coming soon, and then having the whole, the whole community laugh you to shame? What did that feel like? Tell me a story. We had to go through something down here after you that I'll tell you about after you're through telling me. You'd sit down and talk with somebody. Can you imagine? Is that a positive? Are you kidding? Of course it is. What is this? Number five, positive number five, heaven will be there. Come on, Dwight. We're playing games now. No, no, seriously. Have you thought about what heaven is? Read this. Language is altogether too feeble to attempt a description of heaven. As the scenes rise before me, I am lost in amazement, she writes. Carried away with a surpassing splendor and excellent glory, I lay down the pen and I exclaim, oh, what love, what wondrous love. The most exalted language fails to describe the glory of heaven or the matchless depths of a Savior's love. Now, this gets even better. Watch this. One more line. If we could have but one view of the celestial city. So let's say that I say, hey, listen, I'm going to give you five minutes in heaven. Five minutes. Just look at everything you can, and then you have to leave. Listen, if we could have but one view of the celestial city, we would never wish to dwell on earth again. I might as well tell you that the, the, the author of those words on occasion would say, I don't want to go back. Let me stay. Please, just let me stay. To us, this is a glorious Sabbath. The stained glass windows are bright with the, with the light of heaven. Do you know how dim this is in the real place? Wow. Positive number six, advanced learning. Oh, you didn't think a university community could get by without this one. Positive number six, advanced learning will be in heaven. Is that good news or what? Of course it is. Don't shake your head. It's good news. <laughs> there, 
Speak, hey, this is really cool. This is cool. There, speaking of heaven, when the veil that darkens our vision shall be removed and our eyes shall behold what the world of beauty of which we now catch glimpses through the microscope. Do you know what's going to happen in heaven? You're going to pick a flower and you're going to go like this. You go straight into the heart of that flower. What took a microscope before, you'll do with your own eyes. Do you understand what heaven's going to be like? And let's, let's flip it around because she does. Here's the next line. When we look on the glories of the heavens, I went out walking early yesterday morning. I mean, Orion, the whole heavens were just ablaze with, with glory. When we look on the glories of the heavens, the stars now scanned afar through a telescope. Can you imagine that? I mean, they do it on sci-fi. Can't, you, can't God do it? Probably doesn't have the sound effects. <laughs> you say, I want to see Pleiades. Wow, the seven sisters. Come on, guys. You know what we've been thinking about heaven? I'm sitting on this little cloud and playing a 10-string harp. I'm so sick and tired of sitting on that cloud playing that harp. I'm ready for anything. Heaven is not that. Heaven is a real place. God has embedded a longing for heaven in your heart so that one day you're going to walk through that door and say, this was the home. This was the home I was looking for. Oh, my. But there's one more. There were seven negatives. Here's the seventh positive. Positive number seven. Ooh, there's more. On six. When the blight of sin is removed... The whole earth shall appear in the beauty of the Lord our God. What a field will be open to our study. Do you understand that when, the, when the, the effects of sin are erased from the biology lab, you have even more wonder? Sin has done a number on all of us. One more. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. This is this, this is this advanced learning business. Unfettered by mortality. Listen, we can live forever. We will wing our flights, tireless flights, to worlds afar. You're going to explore the whole universe. Don't you tell me. This is a, oh, what a drag. I got to go to heaven now. Never. All right, positive number seven. The people we witness to will be there as well. The way you've been living across the hall from that kid, He's been watching you like a, like a hawk. He's picking up a lot about Jesus just by watching you. The way you've been working with that girl at the reception desk, every time you come into your office, you're there, you drop a little word of grace into her consciousness. One day, God is going to reap what you sowed. Can you imagine what heaven's going to be like when you begin to meet these people? Watch this great controversy. The last quote from the apocalyptic classic, the redeemed will be sharers in his joy, in Jesus' joy, as they behold among the blessed those who have been won to Christ through their prayers, through their labors, and their loving sacrifice. Are you praying for some lost person today? Good for you. Don't stop. One day when that lost person says, hey, my guardian angel tells me you're the one that prayed me into this place. I want to tell you how thankful I am that you didn't quit. Do you know what kind of payoff that will be? You can't buy it. Wow. Gladness unspeakable will fill your heart when you behold those whom you have won for Christ and you see that that one has gained others and these still others all brought into the haven of rest there to lay their crowns at Jesus' feet and to praise him through the endless cycles of eternity. One became two, became four. You didn't know this. You just did that one. That's all God asked of you. But he knew all of them will be there because of you. Don't quit praying. Don't quit living out Jesus' love. You're getting on a plane to go home, live it to the people who are on that plane. Don't take for granted that everybody in that dormitory is destined for heaven. You keep living Jesus to the neighbors you have. Wow. He has placed eternity in our hearts. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. And on the eve of another Thanksgiving... 
This one darkened and gloomier than the Thanksgiving's past. We need to still live with hope. Hope that this too shall pass. Hope that Christ shall come soon. Hope that our destiny and our destination one day soon will be heaven. Hope, hope, hope. And then the homecoming, oh my, oh my. I want to end with this. Henry Garippi, in his book, A Hundred Portraits of Christ, tells about Theodore Roosevelt. You remember Theodore Roosevelt, the former president? He was a big hunter. He, takes, he, he goes on a safari to the continent of Africa, a big hunting safari. It's great success. When he comes back to his ship, mission accomplished. The crowds are there in that African port to cheer him on as he ascends the gangplank, cheering on the former president of the United States of America. He steps onto that boat. Every preparation has been made for him. There is a suite above all suites that he will occupy. He has stewards serving him hand and foot, night and day. He is the center of life on that transoceanic voyage. Also boarding that ship much later, was another passenger. He is an old missionary going home from Africa. His wife is dead. His children are gone. There's nobody to welcome him on board. He makes that voyage all alone until that sailing vessel lands in San Francisco where the story is repeated again because the former president will now descend the gangplank, basking glory as the bells ring and the whistles sound and the crowds gather, cheer the president, the former president who has returned. And when all the commotion is over, there's a little old man with a duffel bag that descends the now empty gangplank. He finds a hotel in that city, and in that little room that night, he kneels down beside his bed, and he prays, Lord, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining, but I just, I just don't understand it at all. I gave my life for you in Africa, and it just... I don't, I don't understand it. And then in the darkness, it was as if God reached down from heaven with his warm hand upon the wrinkled shoulder of that missionary, and God whispered, missionary, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. When you gather with your whomever. Maybe it's just you at a little table this Thanksgiving, or you will be with a few others. Would you remind them for us, we are not home yet. And oh my, <laughs> there is a homecoming being planned. I tell you what, there ain't ever going to be a welcome home party like the one that's going, they're going to throw when you walk through that gate. <laughs> We are not home yet. Pass the word and pray the prayer, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, God, you have placed eternity in our hearts, but we're not home yet. We get it. So please. Don't let hope be snuffed out. Keep eternity flick flickering brightly in our hearts. And may Jesus, who promised to return, come soon so that where he is, we may be also, all of us, all of us right here, right now, all of us going home together with Jesus. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to join us in worship today. I'd like to spend another moment with you here at the end of our program to share a word of hope. In fact, that's what this little book is all about. 
in these uncertain times, and let's face it, they're uncertain all over this planet. This book entitled The Great Hope will help you understand not just what God has planned for your future, but for the future of the entire human race. Light keeps shining on this dark old world and new truths long forgotten are being constantly rediscovered. If you need a fresh dose of hope for your life these days, or you know somebody else who could sure use that gift of hope, then I'd like to invite you to grab your phone, dial our toll-free number, 877, the two words, His Will, 877, His Will, and at no charge to you, we'll get a copy in the mail to you right away. Till the next time we meet, may the peace and hope of the Lord Jesus be with you 24-7.